Chapter Twenty of True Tales of Arctic Heroism in the New World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. True Tales of Arctic Heroism in the New World by Adolphus W. Greeley. Chapter Twenty The Fidelity of Eskimo Bronlund. And truly he who here has run his bright career, and served men nobly, and acceptance found, and borne to light, and write his witness high, what better could he wish than then to die? Arnold The Milius Erickson Arctic Expedition of 1905 sailed for the east coast of Greenland in the ship Denmark, commanded by Captain Troll, Danish Royal Navy. Its purpose was to continue the remarkable surveys of the Danish government by completing the coastline of northeast Greenland. From its winter quarters at Cape Bismarck at 76 degrees and 14 minutes north, autumnal sledge parties established advance depots of supplies in order to facilitate the travel of its surveying parties the following spring. The field work was under charge of Milius Eriksson personally, a Danish explorer of ability and experience, already distinguished for successful work in northwestern Greenland. It was planned that near the 82nd parallel of north latitude, the main party should be divided so as to complete the work that season. Lieutenant Koch was to outline the southeastern shorelines of the land to the north of Greenland, while Milius Eriksson was to carry his surveys inland, until they joined those of Peary, thus filling in the totally unknown regions of extreme northeastern Greenland. This plan was carried out in the spring of 1906, the two parties separating at Northeast Cape, whence Koch struck courageously north on May the 1st, with food for fourteen days only. Game fortunately came to him, and he was enabled to advance his country's colors to an unprecedentedly northern latitude for Denmark, 83.5 degrees north, and by his explorations to complete the survey of the most northerly land of the globe, originally named Hazen Land, which is now known as Perry Land. The brilliant discoveries, tragic experiences, and heroic struggles of Milius Eriksson and his topographer Hagen, and the fidelity unto death of his Eskimo dog-driver, Jorgen Brunlund, are briefly outlined in this narrative. After the long winter of sunless days and bitter cold, it was with high hopes and cheery hearts that the long line of dog-drawn sledges followed Milius Eriksson as they wended their way northwards at the end of March 1907. With ten sledges and nearly a hundred dogs, much was to be done by the resolute men who feared neither cold nor famine, the dangers of the sea ice or the hardships of the trail. Their courage and strength were soon tested by difficulties and perils of unexpected character, for they thought to find the ordinary ice food among the shore, which could be followed inward or outward as the character of the ice dictated. But there was no ice foot. A long glacier gulf, for the distance of 140 miles, the glacial ice cap of Greenland, known usually as the inland ice, moves summer and winter, with unbroken vertical front hundreds of feet in height, slowly but unceasingly into the Greenland Sea. Between the steady southward drift of the vast ice fields from the Arctic Ocean, and the seaward march of the glacier, the shore ice was found to be of almost incredible roughness. Magnificent, and unequally elsewhere in the world, was the sight of this towering sea face, but scores upon scores of miles of ever-dominating ice cliffs, through their weeks of struggle, grew to be unwelcome, so that their end at Lambert Land was hailed with joy. Here came unexpected food, which did much to make the completion of the survey possible, 
as they were crossing the smooth fjord ice brunland's keen and practised eye saw far shoreward tiny specks of moving animals and he shouted loudly nanetok a bear they proved to be two mother bears with cubs in a trice the teams were stopped the trace toggle slipped from the few dogs that were used to bear hunting who started excitedly on the jump for the already fleeing game soon catching up with the lumbering animals slow moving on account of the cubs the dogs followed their usual tactics of nipping sharply the hind legs of the bear who stops to drive off the dog or stumbles forward with the dog fast at his legs meantime Bronlund and tobias the two eskimo dog drivers quickly threw off the sledge loads on the floe and drove on with such speed that the hunters were soon within shot the bears skinned and the dogs fed the northward march was renewed in high spirits for the slow travel had sadly reduced their food they were nearly in despair on reaching the south shore of mount malemuk as the open sea made it impossible to pass around it with exhausting labor they finally were able to clamber up a projecting point of the seaward flowing glacier but their first supporting sledge here turned homeward difficult as had been the ice and the glacier scaling they came to a real danger when around malemuk they were driven far out on the ocean in order to proceed northward for the inland ice was impossible of passage and great areas of open water gave way slowly seaward to new ice this was so thin that it bent and crackled as sledge after sledge tried in separate and fearsome order a passage that threatened to engulf them at any moment yet they came safely to amdrup land eighty degrees and forty-three minutes north whence the last supporting party returned charged to explore on their homeward journey the unknown fjords to the north of lambert land where their spring discoveries of new lands had begun pressing on after the return of the supporting sledges milius ericsson was surprised and disappointed to find that the coast continued to trend to the northeast and not to the northwest as indicated by all charts since peary crossed the inland ice to navy cliff this northeasterly trend greatly increased the length of the journey needful to complete the survey of the entire east coast their equipment had been planned for the shorter distance and it was evident that this forced detour would soon leave them without food for themselves or for their dogs unless more game should be found they thought that this extension would never end but it was finally reached at cape northeast at eighty two degrees and thirty minutes north twelve degrees west no less than twenty two degrees of longitude to the eastward of peary's location of the greenland sea in his discoveries of eighteen ninety two and eighteen ninety five the new cape was half way between navy cliff and spitzbergen thus narrowing by one half the largest connecting waterway of the arctic and the atlantic oceans it was a magnificent discovery for which some of these explorers were to pay with their lives milius ericsson and koch counseled seriously together and well they might they had been on the march more than a month coming summer with a disintegrating ice pack and the dreaded malemuk mountain precipices sea washed at their base were to be faced on their homeward journey and to crown all they had provisions for only fourteen days imbued with the high danish spirit they duly weighed with national calmness the pros and the cons only asking each other how and what with their pitiful means they could further do for the glory of denmark the heroic loyalty of both men found full expression in the decision that it was their bounded duty to go forward and to finish the survey with which they were charged regardless of possible dangers and personal privations so koch marched northward while milius ericsson turned westward 
toward Navy Cliff, nearly two hundred miles distant. The westward explorations had been made much more important by the unexpected easterly extension of Greenland, which left a great gap in its northern shoreline that must at all hazards be surveyed. Starting with topographer Hagen and the Greenlander dog driver Brunland, Ericsson reached a great inland fjord, Denmark, which he naturally took for the one charted by Peary as bordering the Greenland Sea. Though this detour carried him a hundred miles out of the direct route to Cape Riksdag, it was not wholly without results. Twenty-one musk oxen were killed, which restored the strength of the dogs, whose gaunt frames already alarmed the party. Here, with astonishment, they saw signs not alone of the beasts of the earth and the birds of the air, but everywhere were indications of their master, man himself. As they skirted such scanty bits of land as the inland ice had spared, they found along every bay or inlet proofs of former human life. There were huts and household utensils, left as though suddenly, circles of summer tents, fragments of kayaks and sledges, stone meat catches, fox traps, and implements of land hunt and sea chase, in which both reindeer and whales were in question. They were mighty hunters, these children of the ice, men of iron, who inhabited the most northern lands of the earth, and had there lived where these white voyagers of heroic mould were destined to perish. The signs of human life continued beyond Denmark Fjord to the very shores of Hagen Fjord, thus clearly establishing the route of migration over which the Eskimo of Arctic America, or of the Bering Strait region, had reached the east coast and possibly West Greenland coming from the north. Footnote. The discoveries of Lieutenant, now General Greeley, around Lake Hazen, of Lookwood and Brainyard in northwest Greenland and Hazen Land, prove that the route followed was via Greeley Fjord, past Lake Hazen, across Kennedy Channel, over Hall Land, probably through the upper valley of Nordeskjold Inlet, and along the shores of Peary Channel to Denmark Fjord. End of footnote. The turning point of Ericsson's fortunes came at Cape Riksdag, where he met Koch's party returning from the north. His discoveries and surveys of southern Hazenland, Peary, where he reached 83 degrees and 30 minutes north, and his tales of game, encouraged Milius Ericsson to go on, though he had food for eight days only for the men, eleven for the dogs, and a few quarts of oil for cooking. Another fjord, Hagen, was discovered, which proved fatal to the party, as Mulius Eriksson felt that Navy Cliff, reported as overlooking the Greenland Sea, must surely be therein. He turned north, on learning his error, only to eat his last food on June the 4th. He felt obliged to cover his mistake by going still to the west to Cape Glacier, Navy Cliff, yet nine degrees of longitude inland. Peary had there escaped starvation by large game, and Ericsson went forward, knowing that without game death awaited him. Now and then they shot a polar hare, a bare mouthful for three starving men and twenty-three ravenous dogs. June 14, 1907, Milius Ericsson connected his surveys with Navy Cliff, Footnote. According to the lately published report of the gallant Danish explorer Mikkelsen, the recovered records of Milius Eriksson show that the insularity of Greenland was not discovered by Peary at Navy Cliff. Peary Channel is only a fjord indenting northeastern Greenland, which extends northward, as shown in the attached map of Andrup Land. End of footnote. He had a right to a feeling of pride and of exaltation, for his magnificent series of discoveries, covering five degrees of latitude and twenty-two degrees of longitude, completed the survey of northeastern Greenland. 
thus had these adventurous men given tangible form to the hopes and aspirations that for so many years had stirred the imagination of danish explorers these discoveries had involved outward sledge journeys of more than seven hundred miles although the party was only outfitted for a distance of three hundred and thirty miles lieutenant troll tells us how startlingly sudden was the change from winter to summer at the denmark cape bismarck the temperature of the snow had risen to zero thirty two degrees fahrenheit and then in one day it all melted the rivers were rushing along flowers budding forth and butterflies fluttering in the air one day only the ptarmigan and raven the next the sanderling the ringed plover geese ducks and others milius ericsson and his comrade had a similar experience just as they turned homeward almost in a day the snow covering of the sea flow vanished as if by miracle here and there water holes appeared the dreadful fact was clear the ice floes were breaking up forced now to the coastland it was plain that return to their ship was no longer possible they must summer in a barren ice-capped land and wait if they could live so long until the frosts of early autumn should reform the great white highway of arctic travel milius ericsson hoped that the outlying valleys of his newly discovered denmark fjord would afford enough game to enable them to live at least long enough to permit them to reach some one of their depots where they could deposit the records of their surveys they reached the fjord about the end of july but alas the big game of the past spring was gone now and then they killed a stray musk ox and like famishing creatures men and dogs ate for months their fill again and again food failed utterly but when death came too near they killed with sad hearts one of their faithful dogs until nine of them had been eaten in the recovered field journal of brunland under date of august seven we read no more food it is impossible to travel and we are more than nine hundred kilometers five hundred and sixty miles from the ship on the eighth ericsson started for the southern end of the fjord thinking that in its ice-free valleys the chances of game would be increased as it was necessary to travel on the ice floes they started across the ice changing from one floe to another when forced to do so unfortunately they were driven offshore and found themselves adrift day after day kept seaward by wind and tide they strove in vain to reach shore but it was sixteen days before this was accomplished when they landed on august twenty four brunland writes we still have fourteen dogs but no food we have killed one of these animals and eaten half of him the other half will serve as our food to-morrow the half of a dog for three men and thirteen dogs is not too much to digest and after eating it we are as hungry as before when land was reached ericsson and hagen applied themselves to hunting hare after hare and ptarmigan after ptarmigan were pursued and killed but alas the volleys were searched in vain for musk oxen or reindeer as it was feared that the big game of the region was exterminated throughout these awful days of suspense and of hunger neither milius ericsson nor hagen failed to maintain their courage and cheerfulness in the intervals of needed rest between the long exhausting hunting tramps they kept on the even tenor of their way ericsson wrote a little poem to distract the attention of his companions from their present surroundings faithful to the last to his favorite vocation hagen made with care and pride beautiful sketches of the country traversed and of the lands newly discovered thus passed away the brief polar summer but further details are lacking since brunland's journal has no entries from august thirty one to october nineteen meanwhile koch had made safely his homeward journey 
and although the anxiety of the officers at the ship was somewhat lessened by the news that game had been found in the far north yet they were nevertheless uneasy as to the dangers of ericsson's home travel koch it seems had found an open and impassable sea at mount malemuk so that he was driven to the inland ice he there found himself obliged to cross a very narrow glacier where its seaward slant was so nearly perpendicular that a single slip would have precipitated men and dogs into the open sea hundreds of feet below later it was decided to send a search party north under mate thorstrup nor was this autumnal march without danger even apart from the perils of travel along the coast where the men nearly perished by breaking through the new ice at jokil bay thorstrup was driven to the inland ice the only possible route at all times difficult this travel was now made especially dangerous by the fact that the old glacial surface was not yet covered by the hard-packed winter drifts thorstrup's whole sledge party on several occasions barely escaped falling into the fearful crevasses seen with difficulty in the semi-darkness of the sunless days as it was several of the dogs were lost when a snow bridge crumbling the animals fell into a crevasse their sealskin traces breaking the dogs dropped to the bottom of the ice chasms which were sometimes two hundred feet or more deep with kindly hearts the eskimo drivers tried to shoot the poor animals and put them out of their misery but did not always succeed as ericsson had not reached the coast the journey was without result thostrup found untouched the catches of lambert land and mount malemuk and turned southward on october eighteenth unconscious that a hundred miles to the westward his missing shipmates facing frost and famine were valiantly struggling against fate and death the condition of the arctic crusoes of denmark fjord though there were doubtless days of cheer and hope grew gradually worse and by the middle of october had become terrible if not hopeless although the autumnal ice was now forming milius ericsson knew that in their state of physical weakness the long journey of five hundred miles to the ship around cape northeast could never be made hagen agreed with him that the single chance of life feeble though it was lay in crossing the ice-capped mountain range direct to the depot of lambert land of course the height of the ice cap the character of its surface and the irregularities of the road were all unknown quantities the state of their field outfit for the crossing of the inland ice betrayed their desperate condition in general their equipment had practically disappeared under stress of travel and of hunting to the very last they had carried their scientific outfit and instruments it was a sad day when they recognized that the only way of repairing the great rents in their skin boots was through the use of the sole leather case of the theodolite even that had quite gone and without needle thread or leather they could only fold wraps around their boots now in shreds and tie them on with such sealskin thongs as had not been eaten the tent was badly torn and with the sleeping gear on which had been made sad inroads for dog food and patches for clothing afforded wretched shelter against storm and cold for transportation there were four gaunt dogs the last that ravenous hunger had spared to haul the remnants of the disabled sledge the winter cold had set in with almost unendurable bitterness to the enfeebled shivering men the weak arctic sun now skirting the southern sky at midday was leaving them for the winter so that the dangers of crevasses and the difficulties of glacier travel must be met either in total darkness or at the best in feeble uncertain twilight discarding everything that could be spared they reached the inland ice on october nineteenth the day the sun went for the winter and barefooted they travelled across this glacial ice-cap 
one hundred and sixty miles in twenty-six days. Their shipmate, Lieutenant A. Troll, says, When I think of the northerly wind and the darkness, when I consider that every morning they must have crawled out of their dilapidated sleeping bags, though they could have had one desire, one craving, that of sleeping the eternal sleep, then my mind is full of sorrow that I shall never be able to tell them how much I admire them. They would go on. They would reach a place where their comrades could find them and the results of their work. Then at last came the end. The death of Melius Erikson and Hagen a few miles from the depot, and the last walk of Bronlund crawling along on frozen feet in the moonshine. With the sure instinct of the child of nature he found the depot, ate some of the food, wrapped himself up in his fur, and died. By Brunland's body was found Hagen's chart of their discoveries, and his own field journal, in which the final entry runs. I perished in seventy-nine degrees north latitude, under the hardships of the return journey, over the inland ice in November. I reached this place under a waning moon, and cannot go on because of my frozen feet and the darkness. The bodies of the others are in the middle of the fjord. Hagen died on November 15th, Melius Erikson some ten days later. The courage and self-sacrifice of Melius Erikson and Hagen for the advancement of the glory of their country were based on conditions readily understood. Officials of high ideals, long in public service, honored with important duties, they possessed those heroic qualities which throughout the ages have impelled chosen men to subordinate self to the common weal. Of such has been said, Gone, in a grander form they rise. Dead, we might clasp their hands in ours and catch the light of their clearer eyes and wreathe their brows with immortal flowers. These young explorers instinctively knew that their deeds of daring would give them fitting and enduring fame. Their faith in their country was justified by the tribute that Denmark promptly erected. But with Jorgen Brunland, Greenlander, it was quite another tale. The virtues of self-sacrifice and of fidelity unto death are practically ignored in the traditional myths and tales of Greenland, which represent the literature the religion, the history, and the poetry of the Eskimo people. Footnote. Among two hundred Eskimo tales and traditions given by Ring and Rasmussen, there does not appear to be a single one wherein the qualities of self-sacrifice and absolute fidelity are the essential or main ideas. End of the footnote. Brunlund had long foreseen the outcome, as appears from his journal entry, We are all dead. From this early acceptance of his coming fate, and from the Eskimo racial trait of calm acquiescence in destiny, it would be natural that in the field the native would have first succumbed. But, charged with a solemn, vital mission, evidently receiving the commands of his leader as the voice of God, this Inuit was faithful even over fear of death, and by his heroic efforts, freezing and starving, ensured the fame of his comrades, and so added to the glory of his distant fatherland, Greenland is a colony of Denmark, unknown to him. Both through the dictates of his noble soul, and also inspired by his leader, he rose to sublime heights of heroic action. All must indeed die, but he would to the last moment of his life be true to his sledgemates, Erikson and Hagen. Without doubt, their last words were a charge, not to fail to place in the Kache at Lambertland, the field charts and his own journal, so that Denmark might know that her sons had fulfilled their allotted duty. They mistook not their men, and the fame of Denmark's officers was ensured by the heroic efforts and unfailing fidelity of their humble subordinate, the Inuit dog-driver Jürgen Brunlund, Greenlander. Among the striking features of the beautiful city of Copenhagen 
are statuary by the famous Thorvaldsen and other great sculptors, which proclaim the fame and preserve the memory of kings and statesmen, of authors and admirals, men great in war and in peace, in civic wars and in learning. It is to the honor of the city that lately there has arisen a unique and striking memorial to commemorate worth and fidelity in fields far beyond the sunset, remote from commercialism and from civilization. Thus Denmark keeps fresh in the hearts and in the minds of her people the heroic struggle unto death of Milius Eriksson and of Hagen, and of the Danish Eskimo Brunland. Such steadfast sense of duty and heroic powers of accomplishment are not the heritage of Denmark alone, but of the nobler men of the wide world. End of chapter 20